Uh, it, it's a list of objects that a French astronomer by the name of Charles Messier uh, made up in the uh, 1700s. He was a comet hunter, uh, and these things got in his way, so he made a list of them. The list outlived him. Uh, incidentally, the English don't like the Messier catalog. They made up their own. Uh, and uh, God bless the English. But the reason that we couldn't see those objects is because of this. This is the Bortle uh, dark, squat, dark Sky Scale. And you notice it goes from one extremely dark to number nine inner city. Uh, we're somewhere between five and seven uh, around here, which means we're not going to really see a lot of telescope of, of uh, telescope objects without help. Now, knowing that I couldn't see anything, incidentally, I decided early on that I didn't really like visual astronomy. Uh, number one, I had a backache every time I took out the telescope from bending over the eyepieces. Uh, the, uh, it's very satisfying, and I liked it a lot, but I realized quickly if it wasn't for me. Now, some friends of mine down in Florida convinced me I should become an astrophotographer. So, I started taking astrophotographs. And it's very satisfying, but it's expensive, time consuming, and you've got better pictures than I ever took off the internet. So I decided it really wasn't what I wanted to do. And I haunt something called Cloudy Nights. Uh, I hope all of you have read it or seen it on the internet. And I came across an amateur astronomer from uh, Oakland, California, uh, actually Livermore, by the name of Jim Ferrero. Uh, he belongs to the club at Chabot Observatory in Oakland. And I went looking for him a couple of times. Uh, my daughter was right down the, uh, the road from there. Unfortunately, I never uh, got a chance to meet him. But he was taking pictures using a Stellacam uh, video camera uh, and getting amazing results that he put on his website. Uh, he had then switched to using it as his guide scope. Now, Jim uh, gave up on the uh, Stellacam a while back, but I didn't. And what happened is I went to astronomy at the beach and Bob was there. And I realized this is something I wanted to try. So I went out and bought the Stellacam. Now, we want to know what is video astronomy, why to do it, and how to do it. Well, definitions vary, but here's what I think. It's about observing an object as close as possible to real time, not collecting data for later. Instead of an eyepiece, using the sensitivity of a camera to enhance your view of an object now, not later. It's about exploiting software, either in a camera or on a computer, to enhance your view of an object now, not later. Uh, most purists in video astronomy will agree that if your post-process is not video astronomy, it's imaging. And on cloudy nights, it's lumped into a group called EAA, Electronically Assisted Observing. Now, the question is, is it imaging or observing? And the answer is, it's both and neither. It falls right in between them, and there are many similarities for both. Now, it's been around, video astronomy has been around since the late 1920s. Uh, you know, video cameras really uh, go back about 90 years. Uh, it's hard to believe that they're that old. But around the late 1980s or early 1990s, amateurs began to experiment with inexpensive CCTV security surveillance cameras. Uh, the earliest one that I remember was a Samsung video camera, 
in a Phillips 2U cam. Now the problem with all of these is how do you control them and how do you get everything uh, working so you can see what you want to see. Now this is the basics of a video astronomy setup. It's a telescope, and it can be a very cheap one, it doesn't have to be an expensive one, with a camera attached and a video monitor. Now the next step was adding a computer and using something called a video grabber card. And let's see if I can show you the, the grabber. This is the grabber. Uh, right here. I'm sorry, right here. There it is. There it is. They are the bane of my existence. Uh, the problem with a video grabber is every time Microsoft uh, does an update on Windows, it doesn't work, it stops working because all of the uh, drivers have to be reloaded. Now, why we do it? Why do we do it? We do it so we can see. Uh, it has some very interesting effects. It increases the light uh, grasp of what we're looking at by somewhere between three and 10 times. So a little four inch telescope can act like a 40 inch telescope. through light pollution. And it'll cut through water vapor to some extent also. Now, the man who originally made up the, the center portion of my presentation is English. And so he um, wanted to, to show what you could see from downtown London. Now, the other good thing about it is it's a great outreach tool. Uh, I hope that most of the people here have telescopes and you've taken them out to a star party. And the first thing that comes along is a little child who knows he has to move, he or she has to move the telescope um, or touch everything that you have. Especially, yeah. This way they can't touch them. So it allows enjoyment of astronomy for those with difficult or reaching high conditions. Uh, you can read this as well as I can, maybe better. Now there's some drawbacks with doing it. It can be difficult to set up, operate, and take down. And the use of projectors, monitors, and laptops produces problem problematic stray light for everybody around you. And uh, everybody remember Murphy's Law? Yeah. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong? Yeah. It does it for this too. And it's got a, for some people, it's got a very steep learning curve, a learning curve. So what equipment do you need? You need a camera, and a telescope, a monitor if you're using analog, or a computer if you're doing it digitally. We're now moving from USB 2 to USB 3, and there's a reason for that we'll talk about in a couple of minutes. Uh, you can use an ordinary uh, Canon camera or a specialized camera. And I've, at this point, moved on to specialist cameras, as you'll see in a minute. And this is just a spectrum of the, uh, the cameras and the sensors that are available. And this is pictures of some of the cameras that are available. Uh, you know, we go through, um, we go through thinking that this particular brand or that particular brand is better. And um, astronomical cameras are like that too. For a while, the Starlight Express cameras are, were the best. That was added cameras. Now it's ZWOASI. Um, but uh, just about any telescope will do, as long as it can reach focus with a camera. Aperture is less important than focal ratio. The shorter the focal length and the faster the scope, the better. Since many of the, many of the cameras have small sensors, uh, you really can't use too long a focal length because your field of view will be too narrow. And one of the most popular and the best ways is a, a, an SCT with Hyperstar, like Bob was doing. As for mounts, 
You can use a, uh, an equatorial mount or a, uh, a, a any kind of mount, mount really, um, like the SC, SCT mount. And most people end up using a focal reducer or a Barlow lens to make the focal ratio uh, faster and decrease the focal length. And you can, as we said before, you can feed the picture to a monitor or a laptop. Actually, I'll go back, go back one. If we can. There you go. There's a video grabber again. I wish somebody had never invented it. <laughs> and I wish that Microsoft would stop updating Microsoft Windows, Windows 10. Uh, now there's a bunch of software that you can use. And we're going to go over the technical stuff in just a minute. Milo Slick is great. Uh, but the problem with Milo Slick is for mountain cams only. And it uh, uses a video grabber. Infinity software is great. Lodestar Live is the one I use most of the time. Astro Live is gone. Um, Shark Cap is the newest one, the latest one. I use that now too. And Astro Toaster. I don't know who makes up the names on these things. Uh, Astro Toaster works with D DSLRs. And you want a place where you can set up. And what can you expect from video astronomy? It increases the light gas in your, uh, grass of your scope by three to ten times. It's great on dim objects like galaxies, nebulae, and globular clusters. You don't get the shimmer of open clusters. You can't compete with the dynamic range of the human eye, however, and you won't get photographic quality views for only tens of seconds of data and no processing. So forget about getting fancy pictures like you see in National Geographic. You ain't gonna get them. But look at the difference. The one on the right is a processed video picture, uh, process rather, as for picture. The one on the left is a video picture taken in just a couple of minutes by somebody out in, could be in their backyard. Now, these are the video cameras that have been available. And um, there's a whole list of them, you know, Look at it and forget it, like, because uh, they're not going to amount to anything. But this is the camera that Bob had, the same type, and the one that I bought. It's called the Stellcam 3. It's actually made in Japan and called the Wacom or Wacom. <coughs> I prefer to call it the Wacom. Uh, it plays back through a, um, a video monitor or a TV. And here's just a typical setup done with it. Now I bought it. The first time I used it, I put it on a Hyperstar uh, Celestron 8-inch scope. It was on my, the back deck of my condo. And I turned it on, and I saw things that I had never seen before and that I always hoped to see. I went through about 20 of the Messier objects in about an hour. You can do it that fast and see them. Uh, I had never seen M101 before. I'd never seen M1 before. Uh, it was an eye-opening experience, if you'll forgive the pun. <laughs> now, after I bought that, of course, you know, there's advertising, and there's the Camera of the Month Club uh, on the internet. And I ran into this advertising from Mallon Camp. Rock Mallon is a, uh, an engineer in Ottawa, I believe, who designs and builds cameras. Uh, and he had what was the camera of the moment at that point uh, called the Malacam Extreme. So naturally, I had to have a Malacam Extreme. And I ordered a Malacam Extreme, and it came that set a mountain cam exterminator because the extreme was no longer even being made. Now, there were better places I could have sunk my money, I can tell you that. Uh, the problem is it's a hybrid camera. Uh, it's an analog camera. Uh, does everybody know the difference between an analog and a digital camera?
All cameras put out a digital signal. An analog camera has a circuit that will convert it so it can be used on a TV or a monitor. A digital camera puts out a signal that can be used on a computer. Now, if you want to use an analog camera uh, on a computer or a, um, uh, you know, anything like that, you have to use one of those frame grabbers like I showed you before. But, take a look at these pictures. These were all probably done, oh, three, four, five minutes each using the Mallon camera. Now, he still makes it. I don't think he sells very many of them now. And this is the software that comes, that, uh, that you actually have to buy separately. He sells a, uh, or sends out a, uh, a uh, program with the cameras. But this is uh, the program that most people use to control it. It's a great uh, control program. I love it dearly, but I still don't use my mountain cam anymore. But I want you to take a look at this picture. This was shot from my dining room table through a plate glass window about a third of a mile away uh, at some telephone poles across the lake. And I was amazed that I could see that that easily. It's not that clear. And it's in color, but it's what I could do at that point. And I, there's a reason I, I wanted to show it because I want to show you the same picture taken with a more modern camera. And I took this one last winter. I've got a condo down in Florida. I put the, uh, the same camera on my dining room table in Florida, went about oh, maybe half a mile to a, con to a uh, condo across the way and took that picture. You probably can't tell, but there's a lot of noise in the sky uh, and it's not quite as sharp as I'd like. Now, of course, right after I got mine, another one came up. This is called the Revolution Imager. Uh, it's very popular. It's still being made. Uh, it's, uh, it's only $300 for the complete kit. It comes with everything you need. It comes in a case like this with the camera. And this is the back of it. And the pictures are just as good as you got with a mallet cam for five times the price. Uh, I think they're, uh, they're still making them, but I think he's about to phase them out. And here are some more that we're taking with that. It just takes a couple minutes to take a picture like that. They're great. Now this is a typical setup with a cheap meat skull. A little bit bigger view, the same, so you can see what it is. And you can see the, uh, the camera right there. It just sticks into the diagonal. The reason for the diagonal is because you're going to be sticking out too far if you don't do that. This relieves the weight on the back of the telescope. And here's another one. <coughs> here's somebody who just did it with a camera lens. Now, I hate to put up tables, but I did this on purpose. Take a look down this column. You see how small each of those sensors is? These are called one-third inch, which means that the diagonal is only six millimeters. There's nothing there. And this is something that anybody interested in astronomy should know. This is called a Bayer pattern. Bryce Beyer was a, an engineer for Kodak, and they were trying to figure out how to get color on a black and white uh, TV. He made this program up, uh, and uh, it's caught on, still on for today. There's one camera uh, that uses the x cran system. Everything else uh, uses the Beyer pattern. Beyer died in 2011, and he was an old man when he died. But of course, uh, right after, uh, I had I decided to buy the uh, Revolution Imager. Luckily, I didn't, because right afterwards, this came on the internet. There's a man by the name of Paul Shears in England. So many of these advances take place in England. 
Paul Shears came out with a program to use a guide camera from Starlight Express called the Load Star and turn it into a, a camera that would take pictures. Now, these took, were taken from his backyard in downtown London. Uh, he's got pictures on the internet of his observatory. He's actually built an observatory around it. Oh. It's a great system. This is still my favorite. It's uh, another one with a small chip. The chip is uh, still a one-third inch uh, chip. I don't know who named these chips. It, it's got nothing to do with one-third inch. But somebody tack names on to the stuff. This is the camera. This happens to be uh, my camera. I bought, I have the color of black and white, but I really like the black and white better. And this just talks about the difference in the size of the chips. Now, over here is the load star. That's the one we talked about and that I have. Now, Starlight Express got the idea that they really use a bigger chip. So they made the Ultra Star. And it goes up from being half a megapixel to being a pixel, a megapixel and a half. Which is, it doesn't sound like much, but it's a, a lot. Uh, it makes a big difference in the quality of the picture. Uh, it's still being sold and made today. Now this is a typical picture taken with that ultra star. You notice how, how sharp and, um, and smooth it is compared to the other pictures? And this is the ultra star itself. This is an ultra star picture. And this is the program that Paul Shears wrote, Starlight Live. And this is just a screen grab. It's amazing how much you can see from a light polluted city. Here's some more pictures taken out. Another one. And you don't have to be a great astrophotographer to get these. You don't have to spend hours taking pictures and hours you know, processing them. Another one. M16, you know what that is? The Triffin. M51, Whirlpool. Now, not to be undone, or outdone, a company by the Magnetic got the same chip and made their own camera and wrote their own software. And this is Attic software. I haven't tried it. Uh, it works well. It's, uh, a lot of people swear by them. They're still being made and sold today. This is M1. But it's not being processed the way would, uh, an astrophotographer would. See the ring up there? Does it show up? I can't tell from here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's called a dust bunny. Uh, there's a spot of dust uh, on the uh, the front of the uh, the, the uh, camera, the, the uh, chip. But this is the kind of results you can get with it. It doesn't take much work to do. You don't have to be a genius. The software does it all. These are just typical pictures taken by somebody in their backyard. Now, anybody ever heard the term steam engine time? It's an old engineering term uh, that means that when it's time for something to be developed, uh, somebody will go ahead and develop it. And usually it's more than one person. It's usually several people. Uh, the uh, James Watts or, uh, is credited, of course, with developing a steam engine. But he didn't develop a steam engine. Number one, he was the first person to patent it. Uh, other people developed it at the same time. There are four or five other people. And actually, the person who developed a steam engine was a man by the name of Hero who was a Greek Egyptian back in the first century AD. But steam engine time came to us, and Robin Glover, another Englishman, realized that there was a market for this sort of thing, and he developed a, a, a program called SharpCap that you could use with almost any camera you wanted and get fairly good pictures without much work. 
Now, it started out as a, uh, in, tw in 2011, as a uh, program to do pictures of the plants. And you realize that there was a market, and so you started developing it. It's now probably the most used program for uh, video astronomy. Uh, we've gone from using, the first three cameras I showed you uh, were, were analog cameras. Uh, they were CCDs. Cameras now change to CMOS, complementary metal oxide semiconductors. Now, his program will run with a whole bunch, a whole bunch of uh, different cameras. Some of these are not available in the States. You know how the English are. You know? They're not going to send us everything they have. And they're going to charge us extra uh, duties on the stuff we send to them. But this is some of the things that his program can do. Polar alignment, live stacking, flat correction. I won't go through the whole list. You can read it as well as I can. But the most important thing on there is polar alignment. One of the things that I learned when I was starting to use my German equatorial model is how hard it is to polar align a telescope. Uh, the better aligned it is, the better your go-tos will be. So you can find things. You, you can see what you want to see. Well, about four or five years ago, a company uh, from China, QHY, uh, owned by a man by the Dr. Qi, uh, came out with a little camera and a program that would get you better aligned. And it did that by taking pictures at several different spots, figuring the center of where uh, the, the rotation was, and then just putting it over the, the true pole. Uh, the camera comes with a computer program, uh, and uh, it's absolutely great. I wouldn't work without it uh, at this point. Now, uh, Robin Glover realized that he could do it with his system. So he adopted the software for his uh, computer program. And it's now uh, an absolutely great way to polar align your skull. Uh, I hope that a lot of you have German equatorial mouse. You know how hard it is to get them polar aligned. But boy, this solves the problem. Now, this is a typical screen using sharp cam. Look how sharp and clear that is. And another one. And another one. These are things you could never see, even with a 10-inch skull, with your bare eye. But it's easy to do in your backyard using uh, this program and some of the cameras are available now. Now this is the screen used on polar alignment. And another picture, the full screen of a picture. Now, um, remember we talked about steam engine time. Well, things keep developing. And a company from uh, China, ZWOASI, brought out a camera that is now um, the cream of the crop for astrophotography, and for pictures like we've just been showing video. Now, you remember that first picture I showed you, how blurry it was across the lake? Much better. This was taken during the day from that dining room table I had. Nice picture, isn't it, for daylight picture? It was taken at 5 a.m. with a four-second uh, uh, four exposure. The camera is that sensitive. But look at that there. <coughs> Took me a while to figure out what it was. It was my wife's chair on the back there. <laughs> now this is a typical picture taken with that camera. I bought one, by the way. I love it, absolutely love it. What's it run? This is M1. You can, if you look up here, it shows you how long the exposures were and how many of them. He stacked them 
This is 15 second exposures, but he did 81 of them. The software does it automatically. Another one, I don't know which flight of that is. The M51. Could be M91 too. Uh, I believe that's a cat's eye. This is 15 seconds. The M81. M82. 30 seconds by 32. Every one of you can do a, pictures as good as this with just a little bit of practice in your backyard. And you don't have to spend hours on hours making pretty pictures that nobody's ever going to look at again. And that's the problem, that's your photography. Most of the asking photographers that I know are really dedicated. They stay in it for a while, then they get out because they realize they're photographing the same thing over and over. They'll go out four or five times a year, spend hours making a picture, and then if they put it on the internet, some yo-yo is going to uh, pick them apart. You didn't do the right thing. You should have done it like this. Uh, actually, I ran into one of them a while back uh, who uh, criticized me for breathing, I believe. <laughs> this is the play of these. M31. <laughs> Rosette, M42, Flame Horset. In this one, I, uh, when I got it off the internet, I left the, uh, his explanation on the top there. He's just using a 60 millimeter uh, cellar view telescope, cheap telescope. They're great. I think they're about 300 bucks, something like that. I've got one, but I keep down for it. M64. That's reversed, but it's the North American Nebula. Yep. <clears throat> you make these pictures, you put them on the wall and let your neighbors and your family ooh and ah over them. They'll think you're an absolute genius, but we won't tell them that you don't have to be a genius to do these things. Now, what we've done is we've gone from this camera size, one third to one half, to two thirds, to four thirds. So that's this new camera that I just showed you. Uh, it's called a 294 from Sony. Panasonic has their own version. Uh, and that is what the state of the art is right now. Now, I thought I'd throw this in. This is my setup. It's on the back deck of my house. Uh, visibility is not great. This is a Telrad finder. This is a stellar view finder that has uh, my uh, cell, uh, my uh, cell view or my uh, Starlight Express with a camera in it. This is a 70 millimeter star, uh, star of a uh, skull. And sitting down here is my 294 camera. And this is my pull master for getting it better polar alignment. Now, I've got to tell you what to me is a pain in the neck uh, that I have to put up with. Uh, I use it primarily with Mac, uh, Macintosh telescope. I bought it originally for a, uh, a PC, because originally the program was written for a PC. Well, my PC broke, and I went and bought a new PC, and it worked fine. <coughs> Excuse me. Then uh, Microsoft updated Windows 10. I haven't been able to get it worse since then. And this is a year and a half. So I, I'm forced to use it on the other uh, map. Another view of my setup. And this is just drawings of the pole master. Now, M51. M101. M81, M82. 
I can't remember which block of that is. These were done on my back deck last fall. It took me about half an hour to take all the pictures. And if I can do it, anyone can do it. They were taken with that low star camera through my uh, my solar view uh, guide scope. M81 and M82 again. Now, what does the future hold? Well, interestingly enough, there are enough entrepreneurs out there who realize when they can make a buck, they'll make a buck. This is called the Stellina. This is an all-in-one setup that will do everything that I put together for probably a quarter of the price or less. It's available in Europe now. It's going to be made soon, uh, made available in this country pretty soon. This is called the Unistellar EV Scope. So you can just go out and buy the whole thing ready to go. Uh, there's a little plug in there, you can plug it in, you can take it to your, uh, your computer, or you can look through an eyepiece. It comes with an eyepiece that's actually a, a, a small video uh, uh, eyepiece. Another picture, another one. It does it all. Wow. This is called Hayumi, obviously. I don't know who thought up that name, but oh. but if you want to learn more about video astronomy, uh, this comes from Agena Astro. Uh, Agena is a, a supplier of astro equipment. They are very very good. Um, they send stuff out right away, but they have articles in their website about uh, things that are pertinent to amateur astronomers, and I, I get a lot of my information from them and from uh, Cloudy Nights. Now, this is the first page of Cloudy Nights on the internet. And there's actually a forum for video astronomers called EAA Observation and Equipment. There are others, a uh, whole list of things. Uh, astronomy equipment, uh, cameras, how to do astrophotography, but uh, video astronomy is getting popular enough that they actually have uh, star parties for astrophotographers. Now, the nice thing about this, and this is going to be done in October, by the way. This is this year. They don't bother you if you have your headlights on. They don't bother you if you walk around with a flashlight because they're using video cameras. And you don't kill yourself by tripping over some of these lines on the ground. Anybody here ever trip on a, on a uh, the uh, tripod? Oh, yeah. I have. Let me take more than once. Uh, but it's a great way to do things. And here's a little more information about it. Anyways, that's how I got into video astronomy. Again, thank you, Bob. I appreciate it very much. The people who sold me the equipment appreciate it very much also. And that's it. What's the adaption to Macintosh? Can you do it with Macintosh? <coughs> Macintosh computers. Can you can you go to Macintosh computers with much of these programs, or are they only geared to uh, to uh, Microsoft stuff? Uh, most of the programs that I use are available both on the Mac and the PC. Okay. Uh, the only program that uh, is not both is SharpCAD. We keep hoping that they'll make it for the, the Mac. Uh, the, uh, every time you look around on a PC, you got, as I said before, you've got a load of drivers. Right. And uh, the uh, there's something wrong with Microsoft for doing that. Uh, I've been out in the middle of nowhere, literally, but right next to Google's people, uh, and everybody starts cursing because they upgraded Windows 10 that day and nothing will work. Yeah. Yeah. And, and not just one person, but three, four, five, six people. <laughs> the, uh, believe it or not, I told that to the guy who used to run Microsoft. And he just got a smile on his face and walked away. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, I, I've met him several times. His, uh, his cousin is a friend, a good friend of mine. So he comes to Detroit all the time, quietly slips in, quietly slips out. But I, I got my revenge. He wrote an article uh, on the Zoom. When Microsoft made the Zoom, uh, he wrote an article that uh, how good the Zoom was compared to the Apple product. And that even his uncle, Irv, wouldn't touch the Apple product. He would only touch the Zoom. Now, um, I have a picture. I sent him a picture of Uncle Irv with headphones on, holding my Apple in one hand and an iPhone in the other hand with a beatific smile on his face. <laughs> he still has it on the wall of his office. And that's my revenge. <laughs> Great. Yes. Are uh, your your what? Maybe I missed it. What mount are you using now? In the I, I moved up. I started with that, um, the the uh, Orion mount, the Sirius. I moved to a GM8 mount from Los Mandy. Then I decided I wanted a Los Mandy uh, G11, so I bought a G11. Luckily, my wife, you know, you, you never tell her that you just bought a new mount. You you always say, oh, I had this in the garage. Yeah. Or head in the office. Uh, so I bought the G11. Welcome to marriage. And at the time I bought the G11, that was the video. And Peter, uh, did you have some photos you wanted to share? Yes. yes. Uh, just a second. Cool. Okay, let's see, let's see if this works on my iPad. My internet connection is not real great right now. I may have to use my phone. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are video photos that you took. Can everybody see this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So. So this is a setup I've been using. It's a 50-year-old equatorial mount, so my polar alignment depends on how well I can line it up with the mark on the concrete. And so I'm limited to about 10 to 20 seconds of actual uh, exposure before I start getting star drift. But you can see I got a little tiny camera here on the finder scope. And part of the reason is, is he talked some about how this chip size is what determines, and your focal length is what determines your field of view. And that tends to become all important, something I didn't realize when I started this, that uh, with the cheaper ZWO cameras, they have real small chips, and so you end up with a real small field of view. Uh, and these cameras range from $150 up to uh, several thousand, actually. Uh, so at any rate, I'll show you a few of the pictures that I've done here, if I can figure out what I'm doing here again. Hi, Gene. <laughs> uh, okay, this this here, this, this is the shot I took right when I started doing this. It was during a full moon. And it's that little tiny camera on the two inch finder scope. And you can see 81 and 82 there with the uh, light reflecting off the, off the trees. That's how bright it was out there. Mm -hmm. But you can still, this camera can still cut through that and you can pick up that 81 and 82. Uh, let's see. So, with the bigger camera then, through the eight inch, there's 82 then, with the eight inch camera, during a full moon. I mean with the eight inch scope, during a full moon. Uh, it's really it's really amazing how this stuff, this, how these cameras are able to cut through the, the light pollution and everything else. Uh, and so as soon as, as soon as I first started seeing this, last February, I guess it was, I was hooked. It's like before this, I just kept wanting to go more and more aperture, and suddenly this technology has a way of, 
just changing everything. Uh, here's a shot of M13 I took last night with the eight inch. Wow. That's nice. Yeah. How long were the uh, exposures, Peter? Like how, how long were each and how many okay. did you yeah. On the M13, it was fairly short. It was about three seconds per exposure, I believe. And then I stacked it for about five minutes. I, I was trying not to blow out the center of it. Uh, here's a shot. So, so, how oh, many, how, so how many exposures were there, uh, Peter? I, I would have to check, but it, you know, if you're doing three seconds, it's probably, it's probably stacking for around five minutes. So it was, what is that? Hundreds, hundred stacks or something. Okay. Uh, this this here was a dumbbell the other night. Uh, you can see I had to go to a little longer exposure. You can see I'm starting to get some. The stars are drifting. Uh, I think I was doing a 20 second exposure on that. That's about as long as I can go without uh, causing real problems. Now you can see how small my field of view is. This is an F4. I'm not using a focal reducer with it. Uh, Still looks great. Hey, I don't. I don't think you have to unshare your screen every time. Just... Well, I can't figure out how to get back to my photos. Okay. Uh, there is 101, and I could not. I had my 16-inch daub out. I could not visually see that at all. And I couldn't see it through the eight inch either, but I, I was surprised. I, I hunted for a while with the 16. I just could not see the thing. It's big and it's very dim. And as I started stacking, all I could see initially was kind of the bright center. And as I started stacking, then the arms started uh, showing up. It's, it's really kind of wonderful because you're seeing all this in real time and live. And uh, it's like every time you turn it on some new object, it uh, just kind of blows you away. Uh, yeah, I can't figure out how to just go back to. Uh... That's okay. This here was last night. I was telling Geddes about this. This is the Eagle Nebula. You can see the pillars of creation. I had a. Uh, uh -huh. I had a filter on there, oxygen filter, and I was I screwed around with the histogram for quite a while. I, I never could get it to looking right, but I was amazed. The, and it, part of it may have been that it was very low and kind of down in the smudge still. Yeah. Uh, but but to, to visually see this pillars of creation start to appear uh, is just kind of mind-blowing, you know? Yeah. Uh, So I guess I'm not familiar with astrophotography, but like when you say to watch it appear, are you watching it like on that monitor? Like does it develop kind of? Yeah, what, what you're doing is you're stacking one image on top of the other. Okay. And so as the images stack, you get more and more intensity of what you're trying to look at. Now and the moon yeah. here, you don't need to stack. That's just a, probably a 50 millisecond photograph there. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can see as I expand this, there's quite a bit of quite a bit of detail there, you know. And that's uh, a single exposure. What? That's just a single exposure, yeah. Boy, you you had some really good seeing. Yeah. Uh, let's see what else I got. Oh, here's a sombrero. Uh, this was before I got the pro version. Get us. I didn't have a histogram to play with, and so you can see the background. The background is they claim the reason the background turns green is because uh, your eye is most sensitive to green, and the uh, light pollution mostly shows the green background. I, I don't know, but uh, with the histogram, you can you can darken that background a lot. You can get you can eliminate a lot of the uh, uh, so. You can download the sharp cap for free, but if anybody wants to experiment with this, I'd highly recommend to pay the $15 a year and get the pro version uh, because it, 
what while you're stacking you can make adjustments of the histogram and you'll see the change immediately on the screen uh, let's see what else we got here <clears throat> This was a shot before I before I had the eight inch. I took that through the ten inch I got of the Orion, and I again I had I didn't have any histogram that I could adjust, and so the colors are all kind of weird. Uh, right. But one of the things you can do is you with the stacking doesn't seem to blow out the center the way that it does when you do a longer exposure, and so you can still see the four trapezium stars there, mm -hmm. and yet yet you're still able to see a huge amount of the nebula. Again, the field of view is pretty small, so uh, it hardly fits in my field of view. Right. Was that, Ed, was that with your light intensifier? Peter. Oh, his microphone is muted. Peter, what camera were you using? Yeah. My my main camera, my main camera is the is that ZWO one seventy eight. Uh it's the color camera. And then I've been I've been using the club's little tiny camera for the finder scope. Uh it's a 122, I think. Uh, here's a shot of uh, M51, I believe it is. Wow. Yeah, that's 51. So how long was that exposure for? Uh, most, of, most of these are five to 20 second exposure time, and I usually stop stacking after five minutes or so because it seems like the, the image doesn't get much better after about five to ten minutes. Uh -huh. uh, I'm not sure why that is, but uh, uh, oh, here's the ring. This is very proud of this one. Uh, the ring nebula. You can see the central star there. Yeah. You know what's neat is you can pick up the green inside. That's kind of hard to oh. detect. Yeah. This was an older one before I had the histogram to play with. Again, you can kind of see the green, greenish background you tend to get. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently, that's just due to light pollution. I'm really, really eager to watch those videos too uh, with you, Peter, because it'll show you how to correct that and make these even better. Right, right. Well, I, I watched your first one. Uh, here's Jupiter. This was through the six inch scope, but again, it was very low in the sky and the, the seeing was terrible. Uh, but that was like a very short expo single exposure. I'm not well, sure I'm what not happened. Sure to mine from last night. <laughs> Great. Where's the moons? You can't see any of the moons though. I, well, I got four or five moons in mine. If if you turn the exposure up to get the moons, it blows out the planet. Ah. Uh, I could just barely make out the stripes. Right. But so, I could tell the difference in the Saturn picture between the, the gas giant itself and the rings. I could see the Cassini gap there. That was pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of the things, one of these things, like he said, they, the human eye's got a lot better dynamic range than these cameras. And so there's a tendency, if you turn the exposure time up, you tend to blow out certain parts of these real quick uh, as you're trying to reveal dimmer, dimmer parts. So I could see the moons real clear, clearly when I doubled the exposure time, but then you couldn't see anything on the planet because it's just a bright white, you know. Uh, Now, another form of electronically assisted astronomy is what Ed's been doing. He's got a, uh, what's called a light intensifier. And basically, it increases whatever light 
falls on it, it increases it radically and you can look at it with an eyepiece. So you can put this light intensifier on a three inch refractor and with the proper filter, we were last winter, we were seeing the core set very clearly. I, I couldn't believe it. it uh, and so Ed the other night took a couple photographs with his light intensifier and the camera and nothing else. And uh, oh, what happened? For some reason it's downloading. There it is. And that's is that the North American Nebula? Yes. So yeah. and get us talking about the other two. Uh, you don't know what the other two were, right? <laughs> In, on the central star signal. Right. On the Seder. right side, that's uh, Seder. That's, that's really awesome. You're looking at the North American Nebula at 1x uh, with no telescope attached. So th this, is a, this is another very exciting field that uh, allows you to do some really great visual astronomy without having to have a 50 inch telescope. Uh, the other night I took this is the shot at the observatory with my camera at 1x. And you can see the Milky Way here. Mm -hmm. uh, and now I allowed that to stack for about 10 minutes. You can see how the trees all blurred, but the stars are still pretty sharp. And that's because mm -hmm. the stacking yeah. program keeps stacking the view even though it's moving while the trees are moving in relationship to the stars then. Uh, we're all kind of excited about that view right there. You can see how much light pollution there is out there. What direction is that, um, Peter? That was looking straight south. Toward east. Yeah, yeah a little, little bit east to south, but... Uh, that's the tractor pull barn or, or all that stuff over those bright lights. Yeah, I get to look right into the sky glow of Bluffton when I play that. <laughs> and then if I look to the north, I get Fort Wayne glow. Now there, there's 151 looking through the two inch finder scope. Wow. Uh, with that little camera. That, that's fun to play with too because it gives you such a wide angle. Right. And uh, it's a black and white camera, but you can stack the images also, just like, because I, I plug both cameras into the computer. And so I can switch back and forth between the cameras. My problem with my particular mount is the field of view is so small that but with the color camera, that it's really hard for me to find stuff. And by finding it with this small finder scope, then I can center that and then it'll be in, in the view on the, on the eight inch scope. Uh, what type of camera is the black and white one? It's called it. It's a ZWO. I think it's a 122. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a little tiny thing, just an inch and a quarter camera. It's a, it's the camera we bought, the club bought, to use on the slit for the uh, spectrograph. Mm -hmm. Turned out we already had a camera like that, and so I've I've been borrowing it, <laughs> but. That camera, Sarah, is only like a hundred and I don't know, thirty or a hundred forty dollars. Right, right. So all all you need I is a Windows computer. And... Can you send me a link to it? Because I'd be interested in learning more. Yeah, go 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 to the website, Agena Astro. What's it called? Agena A G E N A Astro. Okay. dot com and uh look under cameras you can see all they got a, a lot of zwo cameras but on their website it's a little hard to find i had to find it for ed is there's somebody gave a real good write-up on these zwo cameras it's about a 20 some page uh thing that that really really explains this whole relationship between uh number of pixels pixel size the, the the diagonal size of the uh, of the chip mm -hmm. and focal length of the telescope uh, 
And then the more expensive cameras will have a cooling, will also have, be able to cool. But everything I've read says that it, the cooling doesn't matter much if you're doing real short exposures, you know, 10, 20 second exposures. Uh, At any rate, if you can find that, if you can find that on the Agena Astro site, it's the best thing I've found yet for a discussion about these ZWO cameras. I'm looking for it. Everything I'm seeing is like I think it's something buyers can hold on a second. Peter, I, I think you did a Excellent, excellent job getting these, especially for somebody who hasn't done any imaging. I'll, I'll tell you, I hat off to you, man. You, you did a great job. Well, I don't know. It, it, when the first time I plugged that little inch and a half camera in, into a scope and I saw what that thing could see, it just it blew me away. I was hooked. Uh, I, I had to do more. Well, so you're, you're, the only problem now is I want to buy this a seven hundred dollar camera that's got a lot bigger chip, you know. So I got to watch. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> you have awesome. aperture fever. Yeah. Right. So that's, that's, uh, on on the Agena uh, site, there's Agena Buyer's Guide to Z, ZWO Astronomy Cameras. I think it had its own separate link. Send uh, send Sarah the the link to that, Ed. Yeah. Or put it in the chat here. Yeah. Be here. I got it here. I, I got his hand there too. Throw it on your screen. Yeah, you know, while you're um, while you're doing that, Peter, I, I, I got to emphasize again with, and and I'm I'm sure Phil is is biting at the bit to uh, to say the same thing. But with just a tiny, tiny, like two minutes worth of post-processing, you take your images that you just showed here, um, and, and by just playing with the histogram just a little bit, um, you can make your excellent pictures even more excellent. So, um, you, you know. It, well, what, what would be interesting is for you or Phil, to see this in action and, and you guys and see the histogram and just do it right there live, you know. In other words, you could adjust the histogram live while the thing's stacking. Right. Uh, yeah, optimize the, the settings while we're collecting the data. That's one possibility. And then the second part is once you got a finished image, like what you've been showing, you can then take that and post process it even more so there's two stages that we can we can mess with uh, that'd be that'd be a lot of fun right no it's it's fun man i it's the funnest thing i've ever seen in astronomy uh other than maybe that thing ed's got but uh uh it's a budget buster though i don't know if anybody else is interested in spending that kind of money but something i didn't you know want to impress on people with what i got there like say that was a single exposure 0.6 seconds and you're able to achieve that and uh, they actually put a step down thing on the front of that stove instead of getting a full 30 millimeter whatever the diameter of that lens is the actual diameter of that taking that it goes through is 15 millimeters so uh and you're seeing like say the entire nebulosity of uh in that case uh, uh cygnus pretty much um, but you do have to stay on axis you, you lose stuff as it goes off axis but it's it gets into your philosophy of what it is you want to do and how much effort and time you want to put in and, and, uh, and also how much money. Right. Right. I will, I will say one thing that this, this, uh, this type of stuff I've been doing, if you got a decent equatorial mount, it probably makes life a lot easier. Uh, I've, I've learned out how to use this mount of mine through by hook and by crook, but all it is is it's a 50 year old Edmund scientific mount with a motor on it. So there's no, there's no control on it whatsoever. It's uh, so if you got a, if you got a computer controlled mount of any kind, it, it would make life a lot easier. 
Uh, I got to use setting circles to find objects. <laughs> uh. Of course, that's another choice then is what you wind up like uh, Jim there did there with his uh, uh, Lasmandy G11 there, uh, yanking that thing back and forth out of the truck. Then you try to step down and then you say, okay, is this going to be precise enough to do what I want to do? So there's always that balance point there, you know. Uh, right, right. And as they say, a German equatorial mount is a lot more precise, I suppose, than an out as. Um, well, I haven't tried anything yet. I don't anticipate taking that long of exposures that, you know, the stepper motor is going in alt as if you're going to, you know, get some funny shape stars or whatever. We'll find out, I guess. I, I would like to try this on your alt as mount. You're supposed to be able to do, if you're taking under 20 second exposures, the alt as is supposed to work fine. Uh, I would I would love to see that image slowly turn as yeah. it stacks, you know. <laughs> yeah. I think it'd be okay if you the, the, you have to balance. The, the balance is so key on that. If it's forward or backward, then it really works on those gearings on, on the motors, and then you know it kind of has to work and gets a little bit out of a, its precision. Right. Well, yeah, that's what's going to happen. You're going to get field rotation. So. Well, yeah. yeah. They have software that corrects for that, but then you have to crop for the objects. Right. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll turn that over to you, Gene. <laughs> this sharp cap, does it, uh, does it auto, will it uh, take that rotation into account too as it's stacking? You know, you know it might. Uh, interesting to me talking to uh, Dan. Is Dan on here tonight? Oh, he's not here. No, no, I didn't. I he seen sounded him. like he was coming, but he's been staying up late and throwing off his work hours and stuff. So well, he said he needed to get back on schedule. Anyway, he's doing some amazing astrophotography. Yeah. And he was out there the other night. He uses that <laughs> sharp cap to plate solve to, to align his, his mount perfectly. And then he's using another software to do the actual. Uh, uh, control the camera and whatnot yeah but if you uh, got a used pc that you want to get rid of he's in the market <laughs> the pc he's got it on is a piece of junk he knows that right. he, he's the one to set it <laughs> well he, he's an apple guy like all the rest of us you know yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah I'm, I'm a microsoft guy not all of us are because I, I like to write my own software i can't do that on a mac right at any, at any rate phil the sharp cap's got about a dozen different things. That guy had the list there that I've, I've barely scratched the surface on. You can use it to focus. Uh, it's got a focusing software in there. Uh, and like you said, you can polar line using it. Mm. And then you can just plate solving uh, also. It had a little bit of flakiness to it, that app that he was using, though. He had to redo it twice because of something glitched and he lost everything. It had to start all over again. Sounds uh, like what? bad software to me, but... That's Microsoft, isn't it? Well, I don't think it was written by Microsoft. I don't think they're responsible for the problem with it. Thank you. Sir. Well, uh, to use that um, software to align uh, on the 16, if we can use it on the 16, let's give it a go. That, yeah. that would be that would be interesting, but you'd have yeah. to you'd have to find somebody like him that knows how to use it. Yeah, there's a lot of little details in it. And there's it's overly complicated. He says ninety percent of it he doesn't use. Okay, well which ninety percent, which ten percent do you use? At any rate, he's he's set up that he could he could be doing the stacking right now on one software of the image at the same time that he's using another software to. Uh, to record for his astrophotography if he wanted to, I think, because he's got it both on there. Uh, it probably need a little more powerful computer than what he's got right now, though. Yeah, you, you can see the steps and the changes in steps like you were talking about, how it just kind of comes together as it works and works on the image real time and shows it to you. And it just gets nicer and nicer and it starts filling in details. And it's pretty right. cool. You know, um, Peter, if you could, please uh, email me these uh, still frames that you presented. I'd like to do I, a little. I, 
that now. I, I figured out how to get them off my Microsoft computer onto my Apple computer. Well, just send me an email and uh, like attach them, t attach right. know, one, one or two pictures. If per they're not too big. Yes. Otherwise, yes. put them on your Google Drive. <laughs> Well, I'm only, I've only been doing JPEGs, which are only about one meg. Yeah. Uh, you can also do uh, TIFFs or FITs, but FITs have been driving me crazy to try to find a software that will open those. Uh, yeah. Dan, Dan said he uses that Liberator. I tried to download it's that. It's Liberator, yeah. It worked. I, I downloaded I, it. I, I, was, I was never able to have any luck to, to download and activate that. You know, Geddes made it sound like that's pretty old software and there's better, newer stuff out there. Yeah, right, Geddes? Yeah, it's at least 20, 25 years yeah, old. See, yeah, but Peter, but that was your opinion. <laughs> but, um, one way or the other, Peter, get, get me a copy of these images that you just presented, okay? Okay, I'll, I'll send you a bunch of them. Okay, thanks. Most of them I haven't done any processing on. A few of them I've cropped. Most of them I've cropped, but uh, I'll send you the cropped image. What I what you tend to get when when I'm doing about a 10 or 15 minute stack, I'll start getting a black line along one side of the frame because my mount's not perfect. Right. And so I'll usually crop that off of there. Right. Uh, yeah. But. No, I've used great. Dropbox works. No, yeah. that's another one. Or box.com. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Yeah. Google Drive or Dropbox. Uh, any, or, you know, if the, since they're JPEGs and they're only one or two meg each, you, yeah. can attach, uh, you can attach four or five of them to a single email, Peter. So just, yeah. just email them to me. That's the simplest way. Where my naps are twenty six meg each. <laughs> no, I I will I will do that. Get us. Okay. Uh, Sarah, were you able to find that? Uh, were you able? I wasn't. I I found the website and I was searching for it, but a lot of different results popped up, and I wasn't sure exactly which one. You know what, Peter? Why don't you share your screen and go to the site and show oh. her show show her that specifically where you want well, to go. that's what i'm trying to find here on my phone i also like the in the presentation he showed some different kits that like kind of came with everything well you know i almost bought that 350 dollars kit there they still sell those and then after talking to ed ed seemed to convince me that i wouldn't be happy with that so i decided not to get that but uh uh yeah one of the things those older style video cameras have to do an analog conversion or, or they have an analog output. And that's why they used to use a TV screen mm -hmm. and they still got a TV plug on the back of them. So they must, and so these ZWO cameras are completely digital output, but. Oh, so I could just and, use my laptop? Right, you just use your laptop. Mm -hmm. uh, Pete, I think that was under, was that under, uh, does it say Astro cameras or cameras uh, at the uh, Gina site? And I think it was on the first page, about halfway down, it gives you CR guide or whatever on Astro cameras or whatever, I think. By the way, Julie, your cat mooned us. Yeah, she, I sit at the desk here and she walks back and forth, let me know she's the boss. <laughs> <laughs> He's my little princess. As our new president, I don't know if that's right protocol. <laughs> yeah. Well, she's my, she's my strong arm of the <laughs> my sergeant <laughs> arm. How's that? <laughs> she can do what you'd like to, right? <laughs> she's the boss. I'm the pet. Mm -hmm. And maybe you could share your screen with that website. I was going to say. You know, I, I can do so little on this thing here. I, I wouldn't even know where to start. I, I understand. Man, I don't know why that, I don't know why that doesn't pop up. Uh, I thought it popped right up when you looked at it. I, the other day when I looked at the site there, I mean, they kind of almost highlighted it to kind of like a blue highlight or something in the middle <laughs> of, the, of the page. What, the live stacking or what? 
Now it's a 24 page. Uh, oh, here it is. I, oh, you might have to get in. Yeah, astronomy cameras and then uh, click on the ZWO offerings and it might be under the ZWO offerings. So you just set, Ed, you set that software up and it automatically just keeps on stacking, huh? You just let it run. You set up the exposure in the, in the, in the minutes that it does everything and for- That's for, what we're doing. Yeah, what I, what sure. I told yeah. Ed was it'd be interesting to plug his camera into that sharp cap and stack those like that vision he had that 1x view of the uh, nebula and stack that uh, yeah. yeah i noticed looking at some of these cameras some have faster download times than others you're doing that well will it stack uh dslrs yeah, supposedly it will but i don't know i i you'd have to plug a dslr and see if it recognizes it it cloudy nights has had that discussion they say it will work with dslrs uh, Phil, did you uh, have any luck getting um, Canon's app to connect up to the 5D2 and? Yes. Yeah, control? we did. Okay, good. Yep. Good. We're good. We had a good session last night. Good. With the spectrograph. Good. We found out that the star lock on the 12 inch scope works fine. Awesome. So we don't need the uh, the uh, guide camera on the spectrum. We just yeah. use the star lock. That's awesome. Great. Julie's getting real good at tweaking that baby right on the. Uh, oh, seat. she sure is. <laughs> Except uh, I always got to remember uh, uh, east is north and <laughs> west to <is> south. <laughs> Maybe we got to figure out how to rotate that rascal. Rotate it. Maybe that'll take care of that. We'll, we'll see next time. Yeah. Or I just have to have a cheat sheet in front of me all the time. <laughs> hey, Sarah. All the time. Uh, oh, shoot. I don't know. <laughs> can you see if you can see the, the URL on my phone there? Uh, I cannot see it. Well, I'm, I'm gonna go higher. Yeah, you got to go higher and up. Yeah. It up. Oh, I see. Uh, focus. Oh. Not clear, is it? <laughs> no. You got to go back a little bit. Maybe. Can you copy? You, what, uh, you were moving it. If you hold it still, it might it, it might zero in on it. I'm just going to mail this to you. Yeah. That's the way to do it. Can you post it to the chat? Yeah, you should be able to. He's on his phone though in the chat, I think on. Okay, I just, I mailed it to you. Uh, how did, how, I don't know how you post anything. Oh, here it is. Oh, here we go. Joe sent That's something. Joe sent it, yeah. Oh, good, good Joe. You're going, thanks Joe. You have to look under the guides. There's a guide on the uh, home page. There's a blue ribbon, like you said, and there's guides and other hints. And you just have there's only one camera application. So it's if, if you work your way through there or use the URL, you get it. Yeah. Yeah, you can click on the link right in the chat and it takes you there. Okay. So Gene, using that Starlock uh, camera as the guider thing there, can Julie still control it from inside? Yes. It, you have enough ports and everything? Yeah, she can. What it does is it just uh, automatically locks on and then corrects. And if you move it, you know, it, you can see it blinks, it loses lock, but then it reacquires and puts it on. So it gets it close. Yeah. Really, did it, doesn't, you, it doesn't move as much as the other one. No, it wasn't tracking very well. This tracks a lot better. Julie, did you end up trying PhD guiding at all? I tried, but um, it, I downloaded, I guess, PH2 point something or other. 
Mm -hmm. And the camera wasn't in that list, and it says if the camera's not on that list, you know, you're SOL. So, no, I mean, the, mount, the mount wasn't on that list. Remember when we got the camera to work, but not the mount? Yeah, one, one or the other. It, I couldn't get everything to work. So You, you can, but you got to use a, what's called an ASCOM driver. Yeah, I, I didn't know which driver to use. I don't know. Yeah, AS, ASCOM is a universal driver. Yeah, there. I know that. I didn't. I didn't know if that would work with that program. Yeah, yeah, it 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 will. Okay, well, mini USB. There's one more night fussing with that. Yeah. Yeah. I just like the Starlock. <laughs> well, if the Starlock work, I think that's great. Well, we can try that, but Starlock's doing a good enough job. But yeah, I'll try that. Well, the Starlock should be more. It's native to the Mead system i mean it should be the ultimate way to go because it'd be on the same yeah. wavelength yeah. i would think yeah but it, if you get the ascom working you you could use it on the on the 16 inch yeah that's true yeah yeah we'll have to find the right ascom driver unless if i don't know if you have to get special different versions that have the driver you want or does no, it seem it, like ASCOM is a working? no it's a, it's a universal driver period and okay, so it'll show all the different ones up. And ASCOM incorporates probably a hundred different mounts. Everybody who makes a mount has that capability. They'll they 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 know ASCOM commands and things so, like that. So when I load the ASCOM, then PHD will find it and not use its other one. It'll automatically go to that one. Yeah, you you you'll tell it to use ASCOM. Um, I, I haven't opened up PhD guiding in a couple of years, but yeah, that was that was the first time I opened it up. I don't I don't yeah. have to use anything like that. So, all yeah. right, little little back to school, I guess. Yeah, it's 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 pretty capable, but but you know somebody made a good point, and you know if you've got something that is working right now, yeah. don't don't yeah, and then, and then I found uh, I found this mini control that was written by some guy at observatory, and it and it allows me to move the scope, park it, and a few other things. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems to work with the LX six hundred. I haven't tried it on the other one. Cool. Gene, was there any reason you wanted to get that to work on the sixteen? I mean, I think the the twelve. Uh, no, not particularly, except that uh, in the future there may be some kind of a uh, of a need for the larger aperture. Uh, depending, there was one uh, uh, of the professors there at Purdue was talking about wanting to do something with an eleventh magnitude star, and so. Or Yours goes to 14, I, I believe. I, I just looked at my book here, and uh, 12, 12 is about 14 magnitude, so that should suffice. Yeah. You only get one more magnitude going to the 16. Yeah, that's true. At any rate, uh, I didn't want to disabuse him of what he <laughs> was right. thinking about. Uh, you know, for undergraduate work, uh, they're not going to be uh, doing cutting edge uh, scientific studies, they're going to be running uh, lab uh, work. One of the things we noted uh, when we did Vega last night, uh, the uh, uh, the vertical uh, lines are skewed. They're not exactly vertical. Which means that, that you can see that sucker rotating, which right. is what, what you know what a slanted line means. The one one side's moving towards you, and the other's moving away, and so it's it's, it's a slanted line. Uh, and we went on to Spica, and there was one shot that Phil took, and geez, there were two spectrums. Well, yeah, it's a double star. Oh. That's cool. <laughs> That's cool. Hmm. Huh. 
So did the spectra change as the star moved across the slit because you're picking up one star more than the other? Or, or? Yeah, I, I'm sure that's what what it was doing. And when you, whenever you get a binary star that is that the two are so close uh, that you can't split them uh, with a telescope on Earth, uh, you can. You're supposed to be able to see the two spectras. So um, uh, we haven't found a star yet. We haven't tried a star yet where where we could do that. Uh, we're just busy trying to get a uh, good full spectrum. Phil's doing really well uh, with with that Canon 5D or D5. Good. Yeah, make, make it yeah. slow, yeah. but stay. Yeah. Uh, get us? Yeah. One of the problems we tried to use the other night, we tried to use that camera, the expensive camera we bought with the spectrograph. And it seems to accumulate data and then try to download it after it, you take the exposure. And there's a big delay between doing the exposure with it and then when it's ready for another exposure. Because I tried to stack with that camera the other night and it would stack one image and then it would take 10 or 20 seconds. It, I was just running it through my laptop. Yeah. Uh, you might try, um, did you, what, do you remember what your binning was set at? Were you binning one by one or two by two or? Yeah, we we're, we're only binning one by one. Uh, okay, so that's, that's maximum resolution. Right. Big, biggest frame and it'll take the longest download so if you try binning two by two or three by three you can really really cut down the transfer time considerably. Well one of the things we were unsure of is that a USB 2.0 or 3.0 that you ran out there to the telescope? I think it's a two. Uh, it's actually 3.0. Oh it, it is? is a, yeah it's cap the the um, the port on the PC that I connected it to is 3.0. It's a fast, and the splitter is 3.0 compatible. So it, you should be 3.0 compatible. Okay, you you bring up a good point. Are all those ports not 3.0 on the front of the computer? Correct. The you got to oh. look. There's a little symbol. <laughs> there's there's a little symbol next to USB ports, and you'll see a little tiny SS. Yeah, and that there's one on the front that's all the way to the right. Yeah, and it stands for like super speed, and that's that's 3.0. Okay. How many, port, how many ports are on the back? So if I run and run another USB cable out to, for one for each scope, you know, I, uh, is there enough ports on the back where I could add another USB extension on there? Well, first of all, there's there's additional slots that we can add card. We can add a card that has yes. two or I, three USB ports, but there's also a USB three port on the back. There's also one in the front. So okay. the, the the PC already has several USB three ports, but we also can for twenty five dollars. We can get a a PCI slot, yeah, you know, keep compatible card and just add, get four of them or something. Yeah, you know, three or four or whatever. So yeah, yeah, you you, you we can do whatever whatever we need to for for almost. Okay, okay. Well, this brings up a good point. We only got one cable running out there. We're using a splitter. We got that slit camera going all the time. It's possible that cable cannot handle both those cameras running at once. Uh, um, no, the USB 3 bandwidth is more than capable of handling both video streams at the same time. Right. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Well, something, something was really slowing that camera down, everything we tried with it. Uh, like, like with a ZWO camera, as soon as I pull my hand away, the screen goes white, you know. With that camera, I would pull my hand away and it would take like 10 or 15 seconds before the screen would go white 
and then when you covered up this green, it would take that long before it went black again. Well, let's uh, or try an experiment and run just that camera and disconnect any other cameras that you may, you know, have running so that you can rule out the bandwidth of your channel and, and see if you can, you know, see, see how the, the big camera operates just by itself with no other cameras, you know, being dumped into that splitter, uh, Peter. Okay. 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 My, uh, my son, Nathaniel was able to finally find a, a driver for that camera. So I was able to run that off my laptop. But like I say, there was these huge delays. Yeah. And my laptop's not very fast. It's only four gigabytes. So. Must uh, be slower. Yeah, that yeah. camera is not meant for like real time stacking or anything. Right. It's, yeah. There's just, there's slower. too much data. That's, that's a professional grade camera. It's got a lot of pixels. And it's, you know, um, it's, it's just going to take 10 to 15 seconds, you know, download that. That's all there is to it. There's, there's a, each frame is a lot, a lot of data. Well, one, one of the things they, they talk about on these stacking videos is that these cameras are so much faster than what the computers are to process this information that the more expensive cameras have an internal memory that they, they build up the data and then they dump it on the computer and then the computer takes a while to, to actually absorb all that data. Right. Uh, so I think that's what we're looking at with that camera uh, that we haven't had the right setup quite yet. I don't know if we ever, Julie, I don't know if we ever plugged it into the USB 3.0 in the front of that computer. I know you said something about the high speed, but I, I about fed up by that point. Yeah, I think I think we did. I don't know. It just seems like that camera is it's slower. It's not like the modern ones. I guess that is that camera kind of older, maybe. I don't know. Which one? The the, the yeah. Go ahead. The CCD camera that we bought. Oh, the the, the big one, the professional one. Yeah. Yeah. Six ninety four. Yeah, well, like I said, that's you got a lot, a lot of pixels. You got a lot of pixels horizontally, a lot of them vertical, and when you're binning one by one, you're at full resolution. Each of those pictures, each frame, is going to be a tons and tons of megabytes, and right. it's just going to take time to go through the pipe before you well, know. Well, we'll try a higher binning rate then, like you suggested. Yeah, yeah but just keep in mind. When you bin, you're going to lose a little bit of resolution. Sure. You know, you, 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 it's a give and take thing. Understood.